This episode of the Speech Science Podcast was brought to you by Presence Learning. If you're considering a career in teletherapy, you need a therapy platform built specifically to deliver therapy and assessments remotely. Exactly. Therapy Essentials, which includes the Presence Learning Therapy Platform, is so much more than your average video conferencing tool. It was designed by clinicians for clinicians specifically to deliver therapy and assessments online. The Presence Learning Platform features a content library full of games and activities sortable by age and interest to personalize your therapy and keep your clients engaged. And don't forget speech language assessments from top publishers. For more information and to start your free trial, go to PresenceLearning.com and then click on our platform. The views and opinions expressed during this show do not necessarily reflect the the policy policy or position of any affiliated workplace or employer. The views and opinions of the show do not constitute recommendations for therapy. Please Please contact contact a licensed SLP for individual consult on your situation. Please listen carefully. What is communication? An essential behavior of life. We have the both blessing and responsibility of trying to foster another. It's transmitting a thought from one person to another. It's the strongest way for two people to convey information to each other. The back and forth between two people. Communication is a lifeline. It's just connection with other people. Connecting people in terms of ideas or thoughts or needs. Draws us out of ourselves, draws us into that relationship, you know, builds up our families. Without it, we'd be lost. Whatever it is that we do to express intent and achieve an impact. Communication is is the ability to express your needs, wants, frustrations, and desires to anyone that you feel needs to have that information. Welcome to Speech Science, episode number 160. I'm Matt Hott, a speech and language pathologist located in Ohio, working in the schools and in home health care. Joined uh, from his sabbatical, our executive functioning expert located in Philadelphia. Watch out for his hands. It's Michael McLeod. What's up, buddy? And our PTSD SLP, Rachel Arshambo. Hi there. And our medical expert on the adult side, Marie Severson, up in Wisconsin. Howdy. Howdy, all. Mike, did you get my hand comment there, West Philadelphia? I certainly did. I certainly uh, did. So I do want to say, did you not get that, nope. Rachel? Right over my head. Oh, Will Smith smacked Chris Rock in the uh, oh. complete version of Rock, Paper, Scissors oh. and Paper One in that moment. But no, uh, my mom does a Oscar party every year and we were watching the Oscars at her house. So so you saw I it live. to see that. I did see it live. I Exciting. Mm-hmm. It was something, that's for <laughs> sure. Did it, remind, but, did it remind you of your favorite uh, WrestleMania event? Ooh, that is coming up this weekend. We are recording this on March 30th, and my boys and I are going to sit up and watch two nights of WrestleMania. That is what we are looking forward to. What you are looking forward to on this episode, we got our winner of the Presence Learning Giveaway. We got a new giveaway from the Barbara Fernandez book, You Got This Sis from Surviving to Thriving as a Minority SLP. Uh, More details will be coming up in a moment. We're also going to be talking about the results of the Redonda Vought trial and what that impact looks like on speech and language therapy, uh, snacking in a sniff. What does that look like? And also, of course, our what's up, Asha, due process and shout out. Today is a full episode and we want to hear from you. Head over to our website, speechsciencepodcast.com and email us speechsciencepodcast at gmail.com. So besides the Oscars and doing some therapy, that was about my week. Miss Marie, let's start off with you because I'm going left to right on my window. How was yours? All right. I've got something good. So as a therapist with a mobile practice, I do a lot of car singing. And this week, I accessed my mix register, which is something I've been working on. It's very challenging. If you're a singer, you know. So I found it, and now I'm ready to get back to all of my car singing. And I've got some new skills now. Oh, that's yay. great. What is your go to car karaoke song? Mm, uh, um, gosh, this is this is invasive, <laughs> Matt. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. Olivia Rodrigo lately. Absolutely. I just love her voice. So I like to try to be her if possible. I have no nice. idea who that oh, is. Gosh. 
I do. <laughs> okay. What does she sing? Good for you. She sings driver's yeah. license. Good for you. Yeah. She, pretty, if you, a pretty famous song. Yeah, too. very famous. I do really bad at Hurdle, and my wife laughs at me every Oh, I'm time. so good at Hurdle. Yes, she is too. So. <laughs> Rachel, how was your week? I was on spring break. Can you beat guard karaoke? I was on spring break this past week. So I laid low. I was, you know, uh, I took a pause from the fairy books that I've been reading. Um, I read The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo, which I saw is getting turned into a movie. Um, so I really enjoyed that. Um, took my dog to the park. And my car karaoke song is Tribute by Tenacious D. Oh. oh, I love tribute. <laughs> That's great. And super sad thinking of um, Foo Fighters because yeah. mm. he is in that video. Uh, the drummer from Foo Fighters passed away this week. Very sad. Yeah, he did. That was very sad. Very sad. Foo Fighters was my first band that I listened to as loud as I could mm -hmm. to upset my parents. <laughs> that very first album they had was amazing. Which one was the first one? I think it was like the color and the shape or something mm, like that. Yep, yeah. yep, yep. That's a with with my hero and Everlong. Mm. Yeah, classic. But I, classic. I found the Foo Fighters right around Learn to Fly. Yeah, oh yeah, that one. That's that's and, the album. Is that the album? Yeah, okay. same one. Yeah. And uh, I just remember my parents were like, "This isn't music," because I had just transitioned from Queen to Foo Fighters. Mm. So. Mm. Quite mm. quite the rebellion. Right. I need to give you a big thank you though. Because you have motivated me to start using my Audible book tapes. And evidently, I had six credits just sitting in my Audible. So I have, <laughs> like, everyone has given me this look of, like, you haven't used them. That's gold. And That's gold. So these are the books that I've downloaded. Oh. A Very Punchable Face from Colin I love Jones. that one. I love it. D Jurassic That's Park. One. That's a big SLP yeah. book. A Promised Land by Barack Obama. Okay. Green Lights by Matthew McConaughey, Ready Player One, World War Z, Good Omens, American Gods, and The Lost World. So maybe I had more than six credits, but they were all like, they're going to expire. Oh my gosh. I'm a, I love Ready Player One. <laughs> That's a pretty good I'm lineup. Really That's really yeah, Thanks. a good lineup. Yeah, I'm halfway through the college joust book, and it is a lot funnier than I thought it was going to be. I really enjoyed it, and it's read in his voice on Audible, right? So mm -hmm. it's really nice mm -hmm. hearing. Mm -hmm. I love listening to the author, especially comedian, who can put those punchlines in just better than someone that's reading it um, that's not the author. So I, I really enjoyed the audiobook for that book specifically. I don't, I'm not going to give anything because like, yeah, there's a whole bunch of punchlines and all that. But what got me laughing the hardest was he was like, I'm going to describe a picture that if you would like to go buy the book, you can then see the picture and give me some more money. <laughs> it's, like, oh God. it's true. Uh, Mike, it's been a while. How are you, buddy? What's going on? I'm doing good, man. Same old stuff. Uh, prepping for the for the summer. I was just recently in uh, Utah for some skiing. That was a good time. Uh, finally able to get away and get a get a little vacation going with the baby and everything, but, uh, but yeah, it was, it was a good time. Awesome! And the baby, did they go skiing? They did not. They were Aww. here with my wife's parents. So that was my first first time away from the baby for an extended period of time, and it was it was rough. But how, I was gonna say, how are you doing? Oh, Aww. look at her! How are you <laughs> doing being away from the baby? How'd you do? Uh, at first, it was really hard. At first, it was really hard. And then once we started getting some pictures and some videos, seeing how happy she was, everything worked out fine. Uh, that's how my wife and I were with our first one. And then yeah. now with the third one, we're like, yep, just uh, call us if anyone like gets hurt or yeah. dead. Like, we're yeah. out. She was fine. She had no no problems. No no transition that's issues. That's good. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Good for well, her. we missed you on air, so we're glad to have you back. And because you. you're back, I figured you could be the person to – do our giveaway tonight mm. and now i gotta figure out where the giveaway is there it is all right mike i want you to pick your favorite number zero through three follow me it's okay zero through three give me your number two <laughs> and then your favorite number zero through nine nine 
Sandy Messenger. She is the winner of one year for Presence War, uh, Presence Learning, uh, the giveaway that we did for the first two months of Yay. the year. So congratulations, Sandy. Congrats. All right. Actually, can I change my number? <laughs> no, nope, not now. We've already said Sandy Messenger. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, so congratulations, Sandy. Yay. And we have a new give. Oh, I'm sorry. Didn't mean to cut somebody Oh, no. Off. I just sorry. said yay. Oh, yay. And we now have a new giveaway. So go to our website, speedsciencepodcast.com, and click on the giveaway and sign up for the Michelle. Uh, I'm sorry, for the Barbara Fernandez, you got this sis from Surviving to Thriving as a minor as a minority SLP book. So pretty awesome there. On the positive side of the SLP world, this is our SS Pod shout out. It's our opportunity to give somebody a recognition for doing something super awesome or sweet in our field. And Marie, you found this, and I guess it's part of our Oscars. So what is our shout out this week? Our shout out is CODA, which is, I actually did not immediately recognize this acronym, which is child, no. Yeah. Child of deaf adults, mm-hmm. yes, which mm-hmm. there are only 5% of these children are born to two deaf parents, fun fact, but CODA won three Oscars, one for Best Picture, one for Best Adapted Screenplay, and one for Best Supporting Actor. I have not seen CODA yet. Have you guys seen CODA? No. No. It wasn't even on my radar, but now it is. Is it a Netflix movie or? I think it's in the theaters. I don't think it's on Netflix, but I actually haven't seen any movies that were on this Oscars lineup um, this year, which is pretty unusual for me. I I really enjoy movies and the last like two years, I just haven't been able to watch. I think I saw The Last Daughter was the only, or The Lost Daughter, I should say, was the only one I saw that was nominated. Matt, did you see Batman? I have not seen Batman, not yet. Did you? you what is wrong with you? Okay. I, what's up? Did you guys I, see it? So I haven't seen it, but my husband is right now at the movie theater for the second time <laughs> watching it alone. I, alone? Alone. He just I, go- re- I respect the mm-hmm. hell out of that. Yep. People that do that, that is so awesome. Good for him. Yeah. He Marie, loved it. I like you, but I want to be friends with your husband. Now. I know. Seriously. I want to go to the movies with him. I'll sit yep. next to him. He's great. I was going to say, I haven't really been able to go see mm-hmm. movies since Movie Pass went away. Were any of you ever like knowledgeable of the Movie Pass? No, but I know nope. like Regal, I think, still has something um, that people are able to go just see a bunch mm-hmm. of movies cheap. The Movie Pass was awesome. It was like 10 bucks for unlimited uh, one movie a day. And now AMC A list is like twenty dollars for three movies a week, and it's not as cost effective. Have prices of movies gone down? Because my husband was saying that the movie was like seven ninety five. Um, I just think it's probably because it's like a Wednesday night. It just seems so cheap. That, that is really it low. Be, yeah, it probably know, is because it's a weeknight, maybe. I was going to say, I know here like Friday and Saturday nights are like $16 and mm. then like Tuesday is like four ninety nine. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I can't, I'm not a good gauge of that at all. And on the flip side, we have the SS pod due process. That is your opportunity to bring something to the tribunal that is M M M M and R and we can debate it for you and decide what you should do next. This one we got, and it says, the teacher accused me of making my data up because it was drastically different than what she got in the classroom. What do I do next? I'd say stick with it. Um, I don't know how many classes teachers have to take in order to learn how to take data, but I feel like in our profession, we, we had to do this over and over again with, you know, the little pluses and minuses and circles, and this is how you code it and everything. Um, we are trained to take data differently and the way that they're taking data might look very different from what we're doing. And, you know, if, it comes to like an IEP meeting on a goal or something that you're like, oh, well, this kid is achieving with 80% accuracy based on the speech pathologist, but then they're only 40% based on the teacher. Like you need to discuss the reasons why that's happening and come to a conclusion. You can work together to see what your data is actually being 
like targeted. Um, but I think this happens more, more often than you think it does, but I would say, keep doing what you're doing. Um, and yeah. We just had a conversation in our district about why percentages are different than percentile ranking and how like we need to be writing our IEPs consistently and then tracking the data consistently. So it doesn't help if someone puts in percentile and then somebody else ranks it or uh, tracks the data on the percentages. That's right. Basic. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But no, I think you're, you're spot on Rachel and Mike, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, but like my immediate thought would go down to, if I'm seeing a student one-on-one versus mm-hmm. in the classroom, the demands of the language are drastically different. And I would expect their language comprehension or vocab skills or pragmatic skills are going to be, I would think, better in a less distraction environment. Absolutely. And, and it's, always, it's, it's different environments. And you always see progress first within the structured speech session. In that speech room with that speech pathologist, you're always going to see the progress there first. And then once you're introduced in the, into the classroom environment and you have so much more of a social context, so much more of a uh, social context, a, a, everything, uh, all of that, uh, that's really... Uh, it's a, it, it's a completely new environment and data changes minute by minute, hour by hour. Uh, so it's, it's really, uh, it's really interesting, uh, to think about the difference between a di- the data you're going to get when you're structured working on the speech goals. And then what the teacher may see naturally with peers present in a structured environment. Uh, and what we're really working on is more of the unstructured. We want to see that natural carryover. To the natural environment and so if anything obviously i'm biased but we're getting more real world data than in a structured classroom mm. yeah agreed we want to hear from you head over to our website speech science podcast.com and you can email us speech science podcast at gmail.com all right our first story up it's pretty a heavy one the redonda vot trial and if you're not familiar with this, and I had to get a nice article that Rachel sent over, a good timeline article, kind of talking about it. But in a nutshell, and if I get this wrong, Rachel or Marie or Mike, correct me, nurse gave the wrong medication to a patient who was into the hospital for a uh, subdermal uh, hematoma and was, gave a paralyzing drug versus a sedative. The patient then passed away. The hospital then hid all of the evidence that there was a goof up. Then the nurse said, hey, I did this. The hospital still kind of hid everything, made the family sign a NDA. Um, And then somehow the Board of Medicare Medicaid got involved and the nurse was at trial. And then now, just recently, this past week, the nurse has been found guilty of, was it manslaughter? Um, I think it was involuntary. Yeah. Negligent. That's right. Mm -hmm. Um, for giving the wrong medication. And what does this have to do with us now when we look at like, are we going to be held liable for something like dysphagia therapy? If something happens to our patient or if we give the wrong recommendation and it causes harm. I think this could trickle down to our profession. Um, I mean, we take a medical errors course as required by our licenses yearly, correct? It's yearly? Or is that just in Florida? I've never heard of that. I've never heard that. I have to take ethics. Okay, so I have to take a medical errors course yearly. Um, Hmm. And I think the... The purpose of that is, and when you sit in those sessions, they're like, how many, how many deaths are caused by medical errors? Uh, Like it's a lot. And I think it says it in this article, it's trying to prevent that from happening. Um, what happened here, uh, Matt, you did a good, uh, timeline, uh, I guess breakdown. 
she, I believe, did report her error. And there's, there's, uh, it's much more nuanced than just a short breakdown of a timeline. But when you have a doctor that's saying, oh, that's no problem, or um, just put the, just get the medicine, don't put it in the scanner or whatever. But then I'm also reading this article that's saying like, she missed upwards of 10 signs of watch out, this is a paralytic versus, you know what she thought she was giving a sedative. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think this is a very nuanced case, but what's happening from here is that nurses are saying they're resigning. They are scared that this is going to make people not want to make any decisions. I've seen a lot of TikToks about it that people are saying, Oh, you know what? No, you go ahead doctor and put in this, um, this yourself, like this medicine you want, go put it in yourself because they're not willing to take the risk now of based, based off of this trial. Yeah. There might be an issue with double standard here. Actually, this reminded me a lot of the book that I was reading complications by Atul Gawanda, who's a physician. And there's a whole chapter on physician errors and how common they are. And it says upward of 44,000 patients die each year, at least partly as the result of errors in care. So it's very common and physicians make errors commonly, but they're often not reprimanded for that. There is a lot of covering their bases or covering for each other that happens just in the culture from what I understand. And I think that potentially nurses might feel like they're not getting that same allowance for having a similar level of risk involved in their job. And I can understand where they're coming from with that. To me, though, when I first read it, I thought this is a systemic issue, just like with most most things in healthcare. Um, mm -hmm. It sounds like there was an issue with the efficiency of their job accessing medications, which means that they were frequently overriding the system that was meant to prevent them from taking the wrong medication. And then when that becomes culturally acceptable in a workplace, everyone does it, and then you open up these risks. So I was wondering why, why did people feel like they didn't have the time to take to access the, the medications as it was intended. And to me, that goes up the chain. Do they have too many patients? Are they feeling pressure? What's going on? And I think that reflects heavily on what we do in the medical setting as speech language pathologists. Do we have enough time to effectively chart review a patient for their risk factors for developing pneumonia, for example, or checking their um, checking what type of oxygen supports they're on, things like that. I mean, are, do we have enough time for that when you have those productivity pushes? Or even simple, are they on a DNR? If oh, you are, yes, right? Yes. I mean, like- Right, no, it does. It, it, you know, we're, it's not, it doesn't even have to be life or death threatening. It's that, are, do they have a DNR? And if they go down in front of you, are you breaking the DNR by- you know, bringing them back. Yeah. Right. And there, I found this other great article that kind of talked about what the implications are in the nursing field. And I haven't heard this phrase like just culture. And it, it was an attempt, I guess, since the 1990s that hospitals have adopted in order to pr promote patient safety, um, remove the cover-ups, the blame and punishment, um, and promote honest reporting of mistakes. Because this woman, this nurse, reported her mistakes, she is now getting punished, lost her license, could spend time in jail for this. It, it's now putting blame and punishment on people. So this whole movement that's, I guess, been happening since the 1990s kind of took a big hit due to this one case. I wonder, though, like the more I read about this and Rachel, I believe you said she missed 10 signs or something like that. Yes, there this are... wasn't. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no. Go ahead, Matt. I was going to say this was not like a life and death situation. If I can, if I if I read it correctly, this was to give the patient an anxiety meds before going into, I believe, an MRI. So I. I feel for the nurse who lost her license because her mess up has taken the life of a patient and that, and somebody that works in medical, this is not what we want ever. 
but it was not like if you didn't give her the right medicine in the next 30 seconds, she was going to pass away. Mm -hmm. right. And I, I don't know where I stand because when I see that picture where it says caution, this is a paralyzer or right. whatever medication. I'm not good at uh, reckon. What is it? Uh, reconciling. We have to do. Yeah. Reconciling medications. I am terrible at it. And it takes me 45 minutes to take care of six patients or uh, six medications on one patient. But I can read a big old warning label and my computer tells me if one of these things interact with somebody else's medication. I, I don't know how I feel defending her action, mm -hmm. seeing again, that it wasn't a life and death situation. Well, th will this prevent does that make though? Sense? Yeah, does, of course. No, will this prevent SLPs and nurses and, you know, the healthcare industry from reporting errors? Mm. Is, is that going to be the backfiring here? Right. They're not going to say, oh no, I made this mistake. They're just going to let the patient die and say like, whoops, as long as no one knows, then that wasn't my fault or something like that. I think that was the purpose of this just culture that has been mm -hmm. implemented was, okay, mm -hmm. she did a good th thing. She reported it. I think it was up to the hospital system to deny or to decide to push that down and NDAs. I didn't read anything about the NDA, um, mm -hmm. but I think the backfiring of this is people are not going to report errors. One of yeah. the backfirings, I guess. I think there's going to be many things that happen. I, I've seen um, people talk about, oh, well, I applied to nursing school and I just like rescinded my offer. I am not going into healthcare right now. I, I think that could be happening. Um, I think people are going to be leaving the profession, just like we're seeing in teaching that they're like, you know what, this is another thing that's put on this another way to lose my license. I'm not going there. So I, I think there's a lot. However, a patient died. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there's multiple signs uh, sides here that you can feel for the nurse and the mistake, but you also feel for the patient that was supposed to be discharged shortly mm -hmm. after and ended up dying. Yep. It seems like it seems like it didn't have to happen. It's multifactorial. The nurse has personal responsibility, but I think it it's a good opportunity to reflect on the system that brought us to where we are with that. I don't mm -hmm. I when I read something like that, my initial instinct isn't fear. It's definitely just more like I'm going to be extra darn careful more than I even usually am, but that's just my, you know, not, I, I could see how somebody might say, well, I don't really want, I don't want to work with dysphagia because I think that that's too much of a liability. And I respect that. And I think that's important to know if that's your limit. Um, but if you are going to work with dysphagia, it's also your responsibility to be educated. I worry because like you said, could this cause a decline in self-reporting of errors? And I don't worry about it as an SLP. I worry about it as a person who uses said facilities mm. with doctors and nurses. As a patient. Right. Like, I, I, this is such a tough situation because I really do, my initial gut check reaction is I, I feel the nurse really did screw up and deter, it like deserves the license removal because again, in my personal opinion, it's not that life and death situation. This was a, we could have taken the time for it, but I do see where some of the other coworkers in the medical field are concerned about a doctor telling them to, uh, uh, override or grab something out of a box. I was watching a video today where a doctor said I might ask for an at a van or something like that. And they get me an Avadin and one is a blood pressure lowering medication. And the other one is a blood pressure raising medication. And if they hear the wrong one or the doctor says the wrong one out loud, who's going to jail for their error. And I feel like in that situation, that is such a unique situation that that is an, I don't want to call it an honest mistake, but that is, I feel so different than 
what happened in this situation. Well, that's mm-hmm. part of it is that I think part of this trial is saying that this is making the criminalization of nurses mm-hmm. for accidental mistakes. Like yep. it, it's a mistake. People make mistakes. However, this is, this is a life and death mistake. You, you contributed to someone's death. So I then think how- like what Marie was saying with these systemic issues, what is causing this nurse to make the mistakes? Mm-hmm. So I, I, it seems like this article was saying that there were 10, um, safety precautions in place before that medicine could be given. And she missed all those signs. So it seems like the hospital is putting in place precautions to make sure that that medicine cannot be given for the wrong reasons. People make mistakes though. What, what's her caseload? Like how many people is she taking care of those systemic issues that we have? How many hours is she working? Has she been on a break? Is is she taking care of COVID patients and there's an outbreak in her area? Like activity there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So uh, again, Mm -hmm. this is another reason that speech pathologists are going to feel the results of this because there, people aren't going to want to make decisions. They're not going to want to, it's another reason to not be in healthcare. Mm. I've, I've got a hypothetical for everyone in the room. Let's say you have a patient who is on mechanical soft and nectar thick. And the facility says we are not going to offer special meals. Who's responsible if that patient gets aspiration or uh, gets aspirational pneumonia? Hospital. Is it, I was going to say, is it the facility who says they're not going to offer special meals anymore? Is it the SLP for not educating the patient well enough on t- like they shouldn't be eating grilled cheese sandwiches? Is it the patient themselves for eating the potato chips and, and choking at dinner? Like it's the hospital. It's definitely the hospital. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> it's not, it, I okay, would never yeah. feel like it would fall yeah. on me. I, I yeah. just, okay. But that's, that's just that's the yeah. hospital. That that's the facility, one hundred percent. I can't. Well, that was imagine. a terrible hypothetical. I'm sorry. I, can, I can't imagine walking into one of these huge hospital systems, being a speech pathologist, and saying like, you know what, you're not doing things the right way, and they they're uh-huh. going to listen to me. They're not yep. going to listen to me. Yep. As a hospital system, they need to one have the speech pathologist there. They need to listen to the speech pathologist. They need to have the cafeteria staff making those meals, educating them on making those meals, educating the nurses on diets. There's so many responsibilities that the hospital has if they want to be in business. This is not up to us to educate the hospital. Mm-hmm. Rachel, I just I tend to disagree just a little bit. I've I've been included on hospital-wide initiatives to improve texture modified diets and Mm -hmm. here's the thing though it takes time and it takes a lot of interdisciplinary coordination and during those sometimes years when that transition is taking place you may have issues happen with choking or with other things like that Um, but it it can happen you just have to be a very motivated organized individual improving yes improving yes because i also have been on those you know uh, pds for for the rehab department of oh here this is what a modified diet is but implementing it or like educating the hospital on you need to have a cafeteria staff that knows how to make nectar you know all these different consistencies like especially these large hospital systems that that's part of their business that they need mm-hmm. to have that in place that we can definitely build upon with our education, with the newest research. We can say, Hey, look at this article that just came up. We're actually saying that the Fraser free water, you know, all these things we, we can contribute to that conversation, but it's not our job to be the deciding factor of you guys need to be implementing this. It should already be there as a hospital. Mm-hmm. I th- is my opinion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the vast majority of hospitals and SNFs out there, you know, I, I agree with Rachel. Like, uh, you know, obviously, Marie, I, you've, you're you a, a leader. And if you worked mm-hmm. at a place where I was, I would ask for your opinion, too, because you're that mm-hmm. kind of person. But I, the vast majority of SNFs probably are not going to respect the opinion of an SLP. 
especially when it is something that may cost more money mm-hmm. based on the opinion of the SLP. I... Uh, so, so that's really, and, and that's what we're talking about. We're talking about having a variety of foods and tailoring to the individual person and being more mindful of things, not, not being super cost effective and getting things done as fast as possible. Uh, they're going to be like, who the hell are you? Mm. I've, I've also worked with nurses that have some ability to modify diets and going up against a nurse that thinks that she knows more about dysphagia. And, you know, I think a lot of the times nurses are viewed as more medically knowledgeable than us. And they are in a lot of areas, but dysphagia we can specialize in. So when you're going up against a nurse that changed the order because she has access to that, um, and you you come up and you're like, you put this guy on thin liquids. He's, you know, nowhere near that. I just did an MBS and we put him on this and this. I, I think that causes some issues too, which I think is something that we're talking about with diet um, later on. I don't know. Hmm. But yeah, we do have that issue as well. And I mean, and then there's that as well. I mean, if you're talking about who's going to be at fault, if somebody aspirates and a nurse is going around changing your recommendations, I mean, no one has ever really accused SLPs of being rogue risk takers who will push a patient to thin liquid sooner than they're able to be to be there. So it's, I don't know. It's very nuanced. Dysphagia is mm-hmm. extremely complicated and it's difficult to, it's difficult to make statements that apply to the situations because mm-hmm. it's so variable and it's a challenge. Uh, it's, it's, tough to hear that people might feel discouraged from working with people with dysphagia because of something like this. But I do sympathize with the nurses and the speech therapists that might feel that way. It's the only part of the field that I'm actually scared to do anything in. I feel that way also. I actually, I had a, not a great, um, grad internship that the supervisor made an offhanded comment to me about me I'm going to kill someone someday. And that I was like, you know what? I'm done. I'm not doing Mm -hmm. this. And it made me question my own abilities in, you know, acute care or the medical setting in general. And I can't do it. I'm not Mm -hmm. putting myself in that position because of what this person said to me, even though I feel pretty confident in what I was doing, that comment ruined it for me. That's terrible. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing that's, I think, some, I don't want to make a generalization, but something that I notice about nursing versus speech therapy is that nurses always seem to, they have a bit more of a pack mentality than I think I've noticed sometimes in our field. Sometimes we're a little bit more individualistic. I think I see a lot of nurses just coming to each other's um, aid and need and defending each other, even without knowing all the information. And I think that they support each other's really strong support network. And I think that Sometimes there's not as strong of a support network for people that maybe need a little more education or maybe there's just a misunderstanding or something. And I think that's something that we could work on. Mm -hmm. Agreed. We want to hear from you. Head over to our website, speechsciencepodcast.com, and you can email us speechsciencepodcast at gmail.com. On the other side of the break, we're going to check in with the informed SLP, and then we're going to look at research that looks at snacking in a sniff. And is it worth it, or should we hold off? You're listening to Speech Science. And now for our regular research review, brought to you by the Informed SLP. The Informed SLP releases a monthly newsletter that brings you plain language reviews of only the newest, most clinically applicable research, keeping you up to date on advances in the field and saving you tons of time. So let's get to it. To the Oral Care Soapbox. This is a review of the article, Oral Care in Acute Stroke, published in Perspectives of the ASHA Special Interest Groups. And this article is available to ASHA SIG members. The benefits of a clean mouth 
cannot be understated, and no one knows this better than SLPs working with the dysphagia population. An abundance of literature, some of which has been reviewed by the informed SLP, supports consistent and comprehensive oral care in our most fragile populations, and current guidelines support oral care provision four times a day. But what happens when these well-supported guidelines simply aren't followed? Cue tisk tisking wagging finger, scolding look, etc. Drizelle Juarez et al. examined staff consistency in completing oral care among patients with stroke in an acute care facility, and the results were, well, a bit disappointing. More than half of the patients in this study had no documented oral care during the hospitalization, and the remainder received oral care only about once a day. That's less than many healthy adults. Full adherence to the four times a day guidelines was not documented for any patient. For those of you wondering if this particular staff was just not great at documentation, other activities of daily living such as bathing and peri care were documented frequently. Actually, based on the frequency of documentation, one could deduce that bathing care was being completed four times more frequently than oral care. Listen, we do think bathing is also super important, but us SLPs do tend to focus on the mouth, don't we? The authors had some theories about the limitations to providing oral care four times a day, such as staff shortages and insufficient education on the importance of oral care. These are important considerations in the feasibility of implementing any guideline, and authors pose that the current recommendations may need to be reconsidered and or individualized. But interestingly, patients with dysphagia had documented oral care more frequently than those without. This begs the question, did SLP involvement encourage vigilance in oral care among the staff? Well, those of us on the front lines like to think so. It reminds us that our education efforts are worth the time. So keep documenting your individualized oral care recommendations. Hang those signs and give those in-services. If we want to see real benefit in oral care provision, we need SLPs to stay on that soapbox. Thanks for listening to this review. If you're interested in more, come visit us at www.theinformedslp.com. Tell us how you put the research into practice or find us on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter at The Informed SLP. We'll get back into the show in just a moment, but this episode of Speech Science is brought to you by Therapy Essentials, which includes Presence Learning Therapy Platform. It's so much more than your average video conferencing tool. It includes everything you need to securely and effectively deliver speech language therapy and assessments remotely. Michelle, the hardest part of teletherapy for me was always having a robust selection of therapy materials because everything I have is either 2D or the toys. So it's wonderful that Therapy Essentials has a content library full of customizable games and activities that I can personalize for my therapy sessions to keep my clients engaged. Plus, you also, Matt, have the ability to upload your own therapy content and materials. So when you have those things you've already made, you can use those too plus a collaborative workspace with multiple camera views so you can see what your clients are doing and they can see what you are doing. And live in-person chat support that can keep you on track. Presence Learning Platform has everything you need to confidently build your teletherapy career. Michelle, if they want to learn more, where do they go? You can start your free trial today and learn more at presencelearning.com. Be sure to click on our platform at the top of the homepage. Welcome back to Speech Science, episode number 160. I'm Matt Hot, joined as always by Marie Severson. Hey. Rachel Arshambo. Hiya. Michael McLeod. 
What's up? Michelle is out this week. So it is the fearsome foursome that is us. And I'm going to ask you a question that I enjoy asking my home health care dementia patients. What was your first car? What was the first car? And you can figure that out however you want. That is either the car you bought, the car that you drove the first time, the car you tested. Uh, I will give you the same parameters that I give to my patients. What was your first car when you think about that first car? What was it? I learned to drive on a Honda Odyssey. So I was a little Ooh. soccer mom dropping off my friends. Um, my first car was a Chevy Malibu Max. So it was a hatchback. Um, good, good car. But learning how to drive in, an, in a minivan was very helpful for like parallel <laughs> parking and parking in general. I, I had, you know, had I remember driving a Camry after that. And I was like, wow, this is so easy. <laughs> like... <laughs> Camry's a nice car. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. My first car was a Saturn Ion. And oh, I miss Saturns. Yeah, my dad loved Saturns. He was really into them for some reason. So I had several Saturns, but unfortunately, I actually crashed it, flipped it on my way to graduation. Mm. Oh, high school or college? High, high school graduation. Oh, wow. Yeah. I still I made it on ask time. If you're okay, but yeah, <laughs> you made it you know, on time. <laughs> you know nice. what's funny? I flipped it. I landed upside down. Terrible, inattentive driving. Totally my fault. Really, really poor decision. But I, I, I think I had like a scrape on my knee. I was wearing my my graduation dress, and I just unbuckled myself, and I got a ride to graduation. Wow. Left the car. Left it there. Didn't need it. <laughs> That's awesome, Mike. What was your first car? My first car was a Mitsubishi Galant, and when it would rain outside, it would rain in the car. (laughs) So there were times where I would be driving, catching rain with my hand, and throwing it out the window. Was that because it was one of those top-down ones? No, it just had a massive hole hole in the sunroof, and it was just a massive piece of shit. Wow. Yep. My, right my, of passage. My first boyfriend had a Mitsubishi with a sunroof that also would rain inside the car. So yep. Ooh, maybe it's yep. a Mitsubishi thing. Yeah, maybe it was the same car. I bet it just stunk. Because, you know, cars, when they get wet, they just smell. Mm-hmm. Oh, it did. Yeah, it did not smell good. It did not smell good. It was it was bad. What my you, first man? car was a 1965 Ford Mustang White. Wow. And oh, okay. in in your brain, right? In your brain, you're thinking it's the hot rod version of the Mustang. And in reality, it got hit by a tow truck and sat and rusted for about 10 years. Uh, and I bought it off of this guy. His name was Mike. His son passed away of cancer when he was 17. And the car sat there for 10 years until little old me at 16 years old sees it, offered to buy it. He sold it to me for 800 bucks. I paid him $100 every paycheck for eight weeks in a row. Uh, I drove it. Uh, it. The back end was all beat to hell. Uh, I had to rev it at red lights so that the engine wouldn't die. But everyone thought I was the guy revving his car at a red light to just be cool. You were and that instead, guy. Instead, it was like, no, I'm only revving this thing so it doesn't die. Oh, my gosh. Um, I used the horn, and it started to smoke on the inside, and it died on the way to college. Wow. In a puff of smoke. And my mom and dad had to come get it and drag it home three hours later. Incredible. Epic. Uh, My wife made me sell that car eight years ago. You had it? Nine years ago. Wow. Uh, it (laughs) it, It just sat in my mom and dad's driveway. And they were like, you need to get rid of this. And my wife's like, we don't have a house. You need to get rid of this car. I sold it. And then like three months later, we bought a house. Nice. And I was like, I could have had that car. Oh, my God. It really is like a rite of passage. Just mm-hmm. it is. Le- learning to drive in an absolutely terrible car. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> I had a car with my friend's nickname, Patches. Patches O'Houlihan, because they kept nice. ripping the paint off of it. Yep. Patches O'Houlihan. So... Hey, line. guys, I thought it'd be an interesting time to bring back the SS pod news. So if you're not familiar with the SS pod news, it is a couple of short stories 
Uh, more just like the headlines and a couple quick reactions. So the first one is South Carolina State. Uh, their speech and language pathology group uh, is now offering free classes, or I'm not sorry, not free classes, free therapy services for both children and adults that are referred from doctors or schools. That's awesome. That's nice. Wonderful. So, so we were talking in the break. Uh, Ohio U, I think we took insurance and we had copay, so it was not free. And I my grad program, I it wasn't free. But the where I am now, our local university has a pro bono clinic, and I also I think they also have a paid clinic. But it's always much cheaper than going mm-hmm. through insurance typically. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think my school did it for free. I think it was copays as well. Um, not sure. That's important because like. with wait lists and, and you know, mm-hmm. say you're, you, there's just not someone in your area, it, sometimes it's hard to access services. Right. I find that it, I, get, I get calls all the time for people that are looking for pediatric therapists. Mike, did your grad school offer free classes or do you remember? It certainly did. Yeah. Yeah. We worked with, we okay. were in right in the Bronx, or the heart of New York in the Bronx. Uh, and the school offered free speech and language therapy. So we were able to serve a lot of individuals that were uninsured and didn't have access. So uh, it was great. Of course, you know, the way things work is they're working with graduate clinicians who are learning. And I look back at some of my first therapy sessions that were pretty terrible. Uh, but it, it's it's definitely a great a, a great service. And it's it, it was a beautiful clinic. It was a really, mm-hmm. r- really nice and well done. And the supervisors were amazing. So the people were definitely getting a positive service. Mm, Awesome. Fantastic. Uh, The second article is coming out of the science daily. And there is a uh, Alzheimer's uh, drug that is in uh, what is this in phase or phase two clinical trial that they are also noticing that it is showing cognitive functioning improvement in down syndrome and against normal aging. Wow. Not aducanumab. This is something else. Say what? It's not aducanumab. No, uh, it is um, where oh, I just sar sargramostim sargramostim. Well, that's interesting. I'll have to look that. GMCFS, one which stands for granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor. Oh, have I heard of? That? Well, I hope that it continues to go through the trials and is successful mm-hmm. as it as it goes through, and hopefully that will be a breakthrough. Mm-hmm. I would love to to have most of my dementia and stroke rehab patients uh, discharged because of a magical wand medication. I am no okay kidding. With that. And unfortunately, there was this drug that was fast tracked through the FDA called aducanumab, and it's been found to have a lot of um, brain bleeding associated with Ooh, it, and gotcha. not enough of a benefit to outweigh the cost of that. So that was a one people were thinking was going to be groundbreaking but unfortunately it's looking maybe not so much so perhaps this other one we're on the cutting edge and our third article uh retiring because of aphasia uh bruce willis's family uh made that known today through an instagram post um one i have a split thought process on bruce willis because he's in some of my favorite movies yep. and then i've heard how he treats some of my favorite directors and co and co-stars and i'm not as a big fan of that but anytime someone's got to step away from something that we work with my heart breaks for their family because uh, i've worked with aphasia patients and the it's not locked in syndrome but that knowing what they want to say but unable to say it can be so frustrating for both the patient and the family Mm, absolutely Mm -hmm. so i'm glad that it's it's getting out there in the zeitgeist and that there's some publicity for, for it and potentially more knowledge and maybe more dollars toward it. I think that that's always potentially a benefit, but it, it is always sad to hear about that happening to someone. And, and unfortunately a lot of what I've seen online, um, just people posting about it or the, whatever station reports it, has miscommunicated a little bit about aphasia. So I'm glad that there are speech pathologists like explaining 
communication versus cognition. And we, we can't diagnose him. So all we know is that he has aphasia. We know his age. We don't know his medical history, anything like that. So we can be quick as a profession to say, oh, he's got primary progressive aphasia. He's got this, he's yeah. got that. Yeah. We don't know his medical history. All we can do is the, the family is reporting that there is aphasia and hopefully he is getting treatment and we'll see him very soon. And hopefully this okay. continues to bring speech and language therapy into the into the forefront. You know, yes. there was a, there was maybe a, a day or two when we read about SLPs working with COVID patients. Mm -hmm. And then that was enough. No one could take any more SLP positive news. Yeah. Uh, but hopefully this, you know, continues to uh, bring us into the forefront. You know, like we had it with, uh, uh, I believe her name is Gabrielle Gifford, correct? correct? Yes. We had, her, yes. We, had her, we had her for a little bit. She's incredible. She's amazing. Uh, and hopefully now a little bit, we can shed some light on the great work that SLPs do because still it seems like 99% of the population thinks we do articulation and stuttering only. Right. I, I currently know of three SLPs that are going to be interviewed by their local news stations on this topic. Oh, That's I know go. one. <laughs> me too. Yes. One of them is me. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Hey. <laughs> so like it. Hey. Nice. <laughs> Mention the oh. podcast. I, right? <laughs> <laughs> transitioning from our SS Pod news is transitioning into snacking in the sniffs. Uh, this is something that I uh, I love the idea of this. As I'm stalling to pull back up the article. This is coming out of Geriatric Nursing, Redefining the Values of Snacks for Nursing Home Residents, Bridging or Psychosocial and nutritional needs. And I can't tell you how many times I've worked with patients that either a dysphagia or just have a questionable oral phase of eating. We have also the cognitive part where food is social. Food is fun, but patients that have to take 55, 60 minutes to eat, they get tired. They become an aspirational risk. I love the idea of snacking. And even if it's like nutritional snacking, we can build this up to have more routines to help a little bit of everything. Mm, absolutely. And I don't know if you've seen those snack carts, but a lot of times they're mm -hmm. they're pretty junky. I mean, there's usually a lot of high sugar snacks, puddings for people who can only have pureed foods. Their options are usually something pureed like a pudding or, um, you know, maybe, maybe even a jello. And... I liked that this this article was a collaboration with Dr. Reva Bearwall, who is the founder of Savories. And these are transitional snack foods for adults and children that start out as a solid, but they melt once they hit, hit your tongue. Ooh. And um, they have different flavors and they are quite... Uh, they are more whole food, if you will. Like they don't have a lot of additives or sugar or anything. There's like a pea flavor, a chicken flavor, carrot flavor. I've tried them and I've had multiple patients eat them as well. And it offers an option for something that looks like food, right? In comparison to what they're usually eating, which is a lot of sometimes just bowls of puree and something that isn't like just a very sweet, sugary, um, you know, junk food, if you will. And that's what this article was showing was that when they interviewed the residents, it's a small number of them, but they had so many different individual preferences and they just felt like they wanted a, a choice and they didn't necessarily always want something that was really sugary. I just found a really good sentence in that article that said, ultimately, we must draw on a fundamental tenant to our human nature that we do not eat nutrition, we eat food. Mm. And I think that's mm -hmm. really important. And I think this could even uh, tie into trauma informed care a bit that we could, I think people could easily dismiss, oh, well, this isn't healthy for them, or they can't have this. But if you have someone coming into a sniff or wherever they are, that are traditionally snackers, um, and then they're being prevented from having a snack or they don't like jello. They don't like pudding. They don't like anything like that. They're used to having this. What are their options? Um, I, I think that's really important that we respect what the patient wants. Um, and I, I'm happy to see this article focusing on snacking when I think 
the traditional focus has been breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep, absolutely. Now, does anywhere that you guys work have these like dedicated snack times or snack locations or anything? I Not have I worked in. Remember. I've worked in specifically. I worked in skilled nursing that has that. I haven't worked in other settings that have snack, you know, sort of the setup snack options. I think skilled nursing is more unique in that. But the carts that I've seen have a lot of cookies, crackers, um, you know, crunchy things or puddings, you know, things that you would get out of a vending machine, I think, for the most part. Um, I'm sure there are some that have more healthy foods as well. But um, I don't know. What about you, Matt? What have yours looked like? Nothing. That's why I'm trying to wonder how I can bring this to the attention of the one place that I work at. I, the closest I've ever seen is like a like a muffin and candy drop off center for people to drop off extra food that they don't want, but it's oh. not really dead. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. oh, I've got my family brought me up this multi pack of food, and I don't like this, so I'm going to leave this here for anyone in the hallway to to come and get. Uh, that's about the closest, but I'm wondering if making a dedicated, almost like in my brain, I'm thinking of this area, we could turn into a dedicated coffee shop, mm, almost, mm-hmm. almost a coffee shop area where the TV and the couches are already set up, Yeah, but we could add just a little bit of more food and we can draw the patients out of their mm. room yeah. to be more social. That's yes. kind of what I'm wondering. That's why I was hoping that you guys had some great ideas for that. You know, because the the one specific memory I'm having is it's a cart that would just be brought around mm-hmm. down the hallways to all the rooms. And that doesn't draw people out of their rooms. But I am surprised to hear that they didn't have a snack cart because I just to offer more snacks throughout the day, especially mm-hmm. the article mentions how people on texture modified diets are at an increased risk of malnutrition. So extra calories is, is never a bad thing for, for some sure. people. I haven't seen a a snack cart, but what I imagine in my head is from Harry Potter when she's going on the train and she's like, anything off the trolley, dears? (laughs) I wish it was that nice, but I also found a really good sentence again in, in this article saying that the research supports that autonomy can be prioritized through the provision of choice, particularly crucial as residents find themselves in a new environment that may challenge their feelings of autonomy and agency. And that is extremely trauma informed all about choice mm. bodily autonomy mm-hmm. or just expressing themselves and preferences which i think preferences are tossed aside a lot of time in the medical setting like oh you'd like cake well we've got graham cracker like right so i i, right. I really enjoy this article um I, i'm gonna go through it more and really highlight it yeah and i'll do an extra plug for the savories. Actually, clinicians can order sample packs. I think all you just pay Ooh. is shipping and you get to, you can try them out for yourself. I've used them as transitional foods for people on pureed diets who are maybe thinking of transitioning to a ne- to the next level if it's appropriate or for people who are long-term on pureed di- diets. I'm thinking people with head and neck cancer who would like something that looks and appears more like a snack when they're out so they can snack on something um, and I've also used it as a communion wafer. Well, I haven't personally, but uh, someone has used one as a communion wafer um, so that they could participate in their religious ceremony. That's great. I like it. Yeah. So let me pose a Matt like question. Uh oh. Are you crunchy versus chewy? Crunchy. Depends on the day. I have a texture issue and if it's, it has to have crisp or crunch or something. And, and, um, I also don't chew it very much. Otherwise I, I think there's probably, that's probably a sensory processing issue that has not been diagnosed, but I think that's common. I think I'm more crunchy. Crunchy. I'm I'm on a crunchy kick. I like crunchy. So I, I like that this article was talking about, they, they interviewed, Um, the participants of this and they looked into different textures of crunchy versus chewy, sweet versus spicy, healthy versus processed. And those are all major things that people prefer. I think I'm also like salt, salty versus sweet. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I definitely have a sweet tooth, but if I'm snacking, I want like chips. I want pretzels, goldfish, like 
ugh, the best. So this is a really great thing that they're looking at for preferences, diet preferences, and snack preferences, not just the three basic meals of the day. I love it. Oh, we want to hear from you. Head over to our website, speechsciencepodcast.com. You can email us, speechsciencepodcast at gmail.com. You can also get on our Discord. You can find us on the Twitters. Uh, we don't have a Tiki Talkie right now, but we do have an Instagram. Uh, no Snapchat, right? No. No, no Snapchat. We're too old for that. But we do want to hear from you. Interact with us any way you want, and we will interact back with you. So the way I'm going to interact with my favorite MM and R is asking, what are you doing this week that you are dreading? Oh, gosh. Mm. What are you not looking forward to? And I will go first. Uh, on Saturday, I am going with my son to do a Cub Scout camp cleanup where I have to bring gloves and water and my son brings his gloves and water and we're going to clean something. We're going to hack a trail or kill honeysuckle or something. And when I signed up for it, I thought it would be gorgeous. But right now I have no idea if it's going to be sunny and gorgeous or 30 degrees and raining because I live in Ohio. So mm. I am dreading that because we may be outside <laughs> in bitter cold hacking at honeysuckle that is what i'm dreading that what about does, you guys that doesn't sound fun mm. um i just got a notice in the mail that i need to renew my license and i have to go in so Ugh. i'm gonna have to do that um i have to pay a parking ticket yeah oh no yeah those are i'm dreading those those are good dreads marie mike what are you all dreading uh, I have to uh, reschedule an evaluation, which is going to be really hard. So it's in the Ugh. books for a while, and now I got to reschedule it because I'm bad at scheduling. Uh, <laughs> that's going to be fun. That's always a that's always a delightful conversation. I always have something for this, but this week I was like. I have something I'm looking forward to. There's nothing I'm dreading. Everything I was dreading is behind me this week. <laughs> I'm like getting caught up on my to-do list. I think what I'm dreading is the potential that there's something that I'm not remembering to do. That's what I was just about to ask yep, you. Yep, that will become apparent to me that I'll have to like, I'll have to like catch up on it. So, well, I'm sure there's something. You are something. dreading the unknown. Yep. Our opening music tonight was Please Listen Carefully by Jazar, licensed under an attribution and share alike license. Our bump music was County Fair Rock, copyright at John Deku. Find his music at soundcloud.com slash dirtdogmusic. The informed SLP used at the count by Broke for Free, licensed under a Creative Commons attribution license. And our closing music is The Slow Burn by Kevin McLeod, licensed under a Creative Commons attribution license. In the immortal words of Janice Wright, always be a willow. The oak looks good and strong until the storm comes and then it breaks. The willow will bend and return to form. True story, I'm cutting down a giant willow in my front yard this week. For fellow willows, uh, Mike... Uh, Marie, Rachel, the missing Michelle. I'm Matt. Until next time, so long, everybody. Bye. The Speech Science Podcast was brought to you by Presence Learning. Rachel, do you know anyone that is ready to future-proof their career and get their teletherapy practice up and running today? I think I know a ton of people that would be interested in that. You can with Therapy Essentials by Presence Learning. For more information and to start your free trial, visit PresenceLearning.com and click on our platform at the top of the homepage. Speech Science is edited and produced by MWH Production. Please follow Speech Science on Twitter at Speech Science PC and like our page on Facebook. And rate and subscribe to our podcast anywhere you get your podcasts.